63. Every measurement related to the breakup of the family starts in 63. Single parent families are now up 140%. Single parent families with children up 160%. Even family morality is dramatically different. Unmarried couples living together up 353%. Let's move to the third category over which we had acknowledged God, and that was our schools, our teachers, our educational systems. What happened when we took God out of schools? We took his principles out of schools. Well, this chart shows SAT scores, and SAT scores is such a good test to look at, the Scholastic Aptitude Test, because it has been in America since 1926. 1941, we put it on the same scale we use today, and look what happened to the scores. They had been stable for years, and then we took God out of schools, and the scores went on a sudden decline. Prior to 1963, there had never been more than two years in a row where the scores either went up or went down. But in 1963, they went 18 consecutive years in a row of decline. Unprecedented. Never had that happened before. Scores are so low now that the Department of Education says this is the first time in America's history that we're graduating out a generation of students who academically know less than their parents did because it's the same test their parents took. It's the same since 1941, and yet look at the difference between the two generations. Now on that chart, in 1974-75, the chart took a, a marked turn. It had been declining very sharply, and in 74 and 75, it began to slow down, and it actually turned back up in 80 and 81. And we thought, now if taking God out of schools is the reason that it's declined, why would it go back up? God's not back in schools. Well, we went back to the Department of Education, and we found at that time that 74 and 75, is the year in which private religious schools started exploding all over the nation. Christian schools began an explosion. For example, in 1965, there were only 1,000 Christian schools in the nation. And why not? With textbooks like there were in Dallas Public High Schools, that was almost being a Christian school. But by 1974, Christian schools started to grow in America. And by 1984, there were 32 thousand Christian schools in America with 8.5 million students attending private religious schools. Now 8.5 million, that would have an impact on scores if the students coming out of those private religious schools had scores higher than the students coming out of public schools. We went back and investigated SAT and according to the SAT board responsible for the SAT test, the scores of students coming out of private schools are nearly 100 points higher than those coming out of public schools. 100 points higher. Do you know where that is? That is the same point that scores had been prior to 1963. For those private religious schools, it's as if no change had ever occurred. But for public schools, their scores are still continuing to decline. Had it not been for the impact of those private religious schools, scores would be moving downward. Now, another indication of, of the impact that, that religious principles and religious educational schools have had on America is found in the academic cream of the crop, the nation's academic elite called the National Merit Semifinalist. That's the top half percent of the nation's students. That's the very top academically. Now we wanted to see out of all those students, what percentage came from private religious schools and what percentage came from public schools. The Department of Education says that of all students attending school, 12% go to private religious schools, 88% go to public schools. Now what that means is that little group of 12% of the students should give you 12% of the nation's cream of the crop, the nation's academic elite. 88% of the nation's students in public schools should give you 88% of the nation's cream of the crop. What we found was not even close to that. As a matter of fact, that little group of 12.4% of the nation's students in private religious schools produced 39.2% of the nation's top academic scholars. That's three times larger than the size. That's a phenomenal differential. We showed that to a U.S. congressman. He looked at it and he said, that makes perfect sense to me. He said, when you're talking about private schools, he said, you're talking money, you're talking affluency. He said, private schools ought to get better scores than public schools. We went back to the Department of Education for that same year and found that the average private school cost $1,100 per student. The average public school cost $3,752 per student. Private schools, one-third the funds, turning out three times the percentage of academic scholars. And what's the fundamental difference between those two types of schools? You look at public schools, you look at private schools, the core curriculum is the same. Civil War takes place the same at both schools, the same year. Math is the same at both schools. A verb is not an adjective because you transfer to a private school. The basic difference is one utilizes religious principles, one does not. And that appears to make a 100-point difference on the SAT test. Now, the final category, the fourth category, what happened in the nation when we took away God's principles? What do you think happens when you start telling students, you can't see the Ten Commandments, you might obey that. Don't steal and don't kill. That's got to have an impact on the nation. Well, indeed it did. Look at violent crime. Increased 544% since the removal of religious principles. 
Now, the best explanation of that I've ever heard came from Thomas Jefferson. And Jefferson said the reason that Christianity is the best friend of government is because Christianity is the only religion in the world that deals with the heart. For example, in the Old Testament, the law says, thou shalt not kill. You get over the teachings of Jesus, and Jesus in Matthew 6 says, I'm not telling you don't kill. He says, I'm telling you don't hate. Well, if you take care of the hate, you prevented the murder. The law, the Old Testament says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Get over the teachings of Jesus. Jesus says, I'm not telling you don't commit adultery. He says, I'm telling you don't lust in your heart. Well, if you take care of the lust, you prevented the adultery. And the founders pointed out that Christianity was the only religion that could stop crime before it started because all crime came out of the heart, and if you didn't deal with the heart, you would never deal with crime. And that's why Christian principles were so valuable. Now, most of the founders had statements that I could have quoted, but I just chose this one from John Adams. And he, Adams pointed out that there was no government in the world big enough to make you do what's right. If you don't do what's right out of your heart, if you don't do what's right from the inside, government can't make you do what's right. By the time they get there, the trigger's already pulled, the knife's already in, they can't stop crime. You have to stop crime by dealing with the heart. Well, notice a statement from John Adams. He said, there is no government armed with power which is capable of contending with human passions if those passions aren't bridled by morality and religion. There's no way government can make you do what's right if you don't do what's right yourself because of morality and religion. Then look what he said. He said, our Constitution was made only for a moral and a religious people. It is wholly inadequate for the government of any other. Now notice what the founders believed. The Constitution would work for people who had internal restraints, internal controls, who would use the Word of God as their standard. Well, we've moved away from that and we see that the Constitution is not working the way it should apart from religious principles. We've seen that on all the charts and the statistics. Now, as we look at things like that, we see how far America has slid. That kind of challenges us because we think, well, America's been a world's leader. We're always a world's leader. It's hard to think of us as not being a world's leader. Well, we still are a world's leader. As a matter of fact, since 1962-63, we've become number one in the world in violent crime, number one in the world in divorce, number one in the Western world in teenage pregnancies, number one in the world in abortion, number one in the world in illegal drug use, and number one in the Western world in illiteracy. Among all industrial nations, we have the highest illiteracy rate. At a White House briefing, we were recently told that just three years ago, 700,000 students graduated from high school who were unable to read their own diploma. In that one year, 700,000 students, after 12 years of school, unable to read their own diploma. Well, looking at the list of categories that we now lead, Jeremiah 6.16 has good advice. It says, if you want the ways of peace, it says, go back to the old paths. Well, what were the old paths? What were our roots? Well, after the founding fathers had declared themselves independent from Great Britain, the next task they faced was that of establishing state governments. We didn't have state governments that were independent. They were all British-run and crown governors. So when the founding fathers went back to establish their state governments, look at the requirements that the founding fathers put in their state constitutions. Now, there were 13 states at that time, and at the time the federal constitution went into effect, 11 of the 13 states had written their own state constitution. Government was still so new that two states hadn't gotten around to writing a state constitution by the time we had the federal constitution. But look at the requirements the founding fathers put in those state constitutions to hold public office. This is out of Delaware. The other states were very similar. It says, everyone appointed to public office must say, I do profess faith in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, his only Son, and in the Holy Ghost, one God and blessed forevermore. And I do acknowledge the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be given by divine inspiration. That's the requirements to be a politician. That was the requirements the Founding Fathers set up. But notice that's consistent with the First Amendment because it did not require you to be from one denomination to hold public office. It didn't say you had to be a Methodist, a Lutheran, a Presbyterian, or a Baptist. It did say you have to understand God's principles. You have to understand the Word of God to hold office here. Now, the reason for that, they explained very clearly on the floor of the Constitutional Convention. You see, there was a third requirement that appeared in the state constitutions, and it said that every public official must acknowledge a belief in future rewards and punishments. He must acknowledge that he understood that when he left office, he would be accountable to God for what he had done while in office. He wouldn't just answer to the voters, he would answer to God for what he had done while in office. Well, we understand that idea of accountability. We understand that we will stand before God and answer for what we do. When will we answer? Well, who knows? We're eternal beings, we have souls, we have spirits. Maybe it's tonight, maybe we'll answer in the morning, maybe we'll answer 10,000 years from now, but we will answer. There's no way around it. Individuals will answer to God. We are accountable. But does a nation answer to God? Well, the scripture clearly teaches that it does, and the founding fathers believed that it did. And this conversation went on on the floor of the Constitutional Convention talking about how that a nation is different from an individual.
When does a nation answer to God? For an individual, it might be in the future. But how about a nation? A nation doesn't have a spirit. It doesn't have a soul. When a nation dies, it is dead. That nation is no more. God is not going to resurrect the United States 10,000 years from now and say, why in the world did you say that the Bible causes psychological damage? And that's the type of statement you answer for, but when do you answer for it? Well, this is what the founders said. They said, as nations cannot be rewarded or punished in the next world, so they must be in this. By an inevitable chain of causes and effects, Providence punishes national sins by national calamities. You see, they felt like that God would deal with the nation right now based on the stance that it takes now because the nation has no other time to answer to God. And that's why you'll notice that in 62 and 63, when we told God he was no longer welcome in the public affairs of the education of the nation, all the charts break dramatically at that point because God deals with the nation based on its stand. Now, that was a principle they understood and they discussed. For example, they pointed to instance in the Bible, Elijah. You take Elijah, who after he had his confrontation with the prophets of Baal on top of Mount Carmel, he won. He went out to Mount Oreb and he told God, Mount Oreb, he said, God, get me out of here. I'm the only one left. There's nobody in the nation that believes in you. And God said, no, no, no. He said, there's 7,000 men left in this nation, men of integrity, men who love me, who have not bowed their knee. They're righteous men. Okay, so we accept that. But you know what was going on in that nation? Ahab and Jezebel were the leaders. They were wicked leaders. And because of the wickedness of the national leadership, because of the bad stands taken by the national leadership, the entire nation, including those 7,000 men, went for three and a half years with no rain. You see, God had to deal with the nation based on the stands of the nation's leaders, despite the fact they were righteous individuals in the nation. Another example given was that of David. When David decided to number his troops, he'd won so many victories, and he came to the point where he thought, man, I win victories. I am just a really strong king. I want to see how big my armies are. And his general drew up said, David, don't do that. He said, God is the one who has won the victories. Don't get to the point where you think you're winning the victories and that you want to see how big your army is. And David said, no, I want to know how big my army is. I want to know how strong I am. Well, that was a bad stand for nation's leaders to say, God, you haven't won the victories. We've won the victories. As a result of that stand by David, the leader of the nation, a plague came on the entire nation, and in Jerusalem alone, 70,000 people were wiped out as a result of that plague. You see, the nation suffers for the results of its leaders, and that's why the founders were so emphatic about keeping men in office who understood God's principles, because in the most famous speech ever delivered by Benjamin Franklin, he said, we need God to be our friend, not our enemy. We need him to be our ally, not our adversary. We need to make sure that we keep God's concurring aid. He said, if a sparrow can't fall to the ground without God noticing it, how do we possibly think that a nation can rise without his aid? And so he called for regular daily prayer to make sure that we kept God alongside what we were doing in the nation. Well, this principle of national accountability was understood by all the founders. As a matter of fact, here's a statement from the inside of Jefferson Memorial. Jefferson made this statement. He said, indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice can't sleep forever. Again, the same theme. The nation does answer to God for what it does. And even a hundred years later, at the time of Abraham Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln was asked by a newspaper reporter. They said, President Lincoln, do you think God's on our side in this battle? Is God on our side in the Civil War? And Lincoln's statement showed he understood this principle. He said, sir, my concern's not whether God's on our side. My great concern is whether we're on God's side. Now, that's a completely different perspective. And they understood that they needed to take stands as a nation that lined up with what God wanted so that God's blessings and concurring aid, as Franklin said, would be on the nation. Well, that's been our heritage. That's been our history. And this has been a little segment that, that we've looked at here. But Benjamin Franklin made a statement that really sums up what has to happen in America. He made the statement in 1774 when he was ambassador to France. Now, we already had this in America. He was recommending this for France. He said, whoever will introduce in the public affairs the principles of Christianity will change the face of the world. He said, you want to be a world's leader? He said, you put Christian principles in your public affairs. Well, we talked about Finney earlier. Look at this statement by Charles Finney, and look how appropriate it is for us today. Finney said this. He said, the church must take right ground in regard to politics. He said, politics are part of a religion in a country as this, and Christians must do their duty to the country as part of their duty to God. Now, notice what he said. He said, God will bless or curse this nation according to the course that Christians take in politics. Now, why is that? Can a nation be blessed apart from God's principles? No, it can't. But where do God's principles reside? They reside in the hearts of God's people. If God's people do not make it into office, God's principles do not make it into office. Ungodly people will not take godly principles to run a nation. And that's why the church has to take right ground. That's why the founders were so emphatic about keeping Christian men in office. 
from the Supreme Court justice all the way through the state constitutions, they emphasize that. Now, as you look at that aspect, and you look at how important it was to keep Christian people in office and how that God will only bless the nation under godly principles, we have to realize that we need to get involved. Now, there's a scripture in Proverbs 18:1 that's very good. It says, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desires. He rages against all wise judgment. You cannot be isolationist. You can't say, I'm not going to get involved. I'm... The founders used to teach their young people. They said, young people, you want to do something good for God? Be a senator. Be a judge. Be a congressman. Be a doctor. Be a lawyer. Be a missionary. Be a pastor. Get out there where you can affect people with God's principles. Well, in the 40s and the 50s, we began to say in America, young people, you want to do something good for God? Be a missionary. Be a pastor. But don't get involved in politics. And when we started getting out, we've handed the system over to ungodly principles. Now, we've got to get involved again, and we have to come to grips with the fact that separation of church and state, it's not a teaching of the Founding Fathers, it's not a, it's not a historical teaching, it's not a teaching of law until just the past few years, in recent years, and we've also got to realize that separation of church and state is not a biblical teaching. Do you realize what separation says? Separation says, okay, Christians, we recognize that you're the light of the world. Just don't get out of the church. Don't shine on anything out of the church. Christians, we recognize that you're the salt of the earth, but just don't get out of the shaker where you might mess something up. See, separation church and state says you can be salt and you can be light, but only right here. That's not even scriptural. You can't do that scripturally. And we also have to understand the fact that there is going to be someone's religion in school. There is going to be someone's religion in government. For example, 1963, in a case called Torcaso Watkins, and again in 1986, the court ruled that secular humanism was a legitimate religion equivalent to Christianity under the law. It's a, it's a viable First Amendment religion by the court's rulings. And it very simply has a philosophy that says God has no place in our philosophy. This is a philosophy based on man, not on God. Okay, we accept that. That's a religion. 1977, the court, in a case called Theriot versus Silber, said that atheism was a religion. Now, how can you say atheism is a religion if they don't even believe in God? And the court pointed out that whatever you believe with all your heart, whatever affects the way that you act, Whatever you believe so strongly that it changes the way you act, that's your religion. So what's the religion of atheists? Well, the religion of atheists, the thing that affects the way they behave, is that they believe with all their heart there should be no religious practice. Therefore, the religion of atheism is the religion of practicing no religion. Now, in recent years, we've also had rulings from the court that have declared satanic activities, wicks and covens and satanic groups, a legal organized religion, equivalent under the First Amendment to Christianity, so that people who give contributions to those satanic groups get the same tax deductions as people who give contributions to Christian churches. Okay, we accept that. But when do we hear separation of church and state? Have you seen anyone go into a school at Halloween and say, wait, get those witches down off the walls. Separation of church and state. I demand separation. That's a legal organized religion. Have you seen anyone go into public schools and say, now wait, I don't see any prayer here. I don't see any Bible reading here. There's no religious practice here. That means it's the religion of atheism. I demand separation church and state. Get the religion of atheism out. No, we don't hear that. When do we hear separation church and state? Anytime there's an attempt to involve Christian principles, that's the big club that they pull out to beat Christians back. Separation church and state. Separation church and state is not part of our history. It's not part of our law until recent years. And it's not biblical. Now, we have lost ground. We have a godly heritage in America and we have lost ground in recent years. We have been robbed, and we've been robbed by the 3%. The 3% has taken away our heritage, and we've lost sight of it. We have to get involved and take back our heritage. That's the roots of America. That's the foundation of America. And the church has got to take right ground. We've got to go forward with Christian principles and get the things back that we've given up in recent years. We have to get involved. You've had just a glimpse of what's available to you through Wall Builders. David Barton has written a number of powerful books that are reaching a lost generation today.